What would you do to achieve your dreams? Think before you answer. Would you lose sleep? Could you stop seeing the people you love? Would you fight for it? Maybe you would, but could you kill for it? The question of how far a person is willing to go is often presented to those who have aimed to achieve their own grand ambitions. Though when does pursuing your dreams become less about achieving personal goals and instead begin to turn to something more questionable? While combing through episodes of Berserk 1997, these questions and more continued to present themselves. However, the linking factor between each of these explorations all seem to connect on one overarching theme, power. Now, I've already covered a short intro to Berserk 1997 as well as an analysis of purpose in my previous video, so if you do want to follow the series chronologically, it's best to start there. Let's continue. Power comes in many shapes and forms through the Berserk universe. We see devastating warriors dominating battlefields, corrupt nobles plotting in royal courts, and demonic forces bending the will of others. Though amongst all these examples, the most potent exploration of power comes in the form of a handsome man with flowing white locks and blue eyes that pierce like daggers. It's funny, I've never told this to anyone before. Griffith and his pursuit of power is historic in the anime world. Some empathize with him while others demonize his choices. In my opinion, he is complex and has been masterfully written by Kentaro Mura and brought to screen in a polarizing light by Naohiro Takahashi. Though to truly understand this character's tale of aspiration, violence and betrayal, we need to look deeper. Most of us would have had a dream when we were younger. For some, it was to become a writer, and others perhaps wanted to lead a group. Griffith, however, wanted to rule his own kingdom. Growing up as a common-born child, he lived in poverty and often had no food to feed himself. His refuge was to look to the end of a cobblestone path, where a castle stood in the distance. Perhaps it was the assumption that the castle walls provided safety or the potential that he could control the events inside those walls. Whatever the reason, he cemented that this was going to be his lifelong dream. Perhaps he didn't realize it at the time, but Griffith's newfound aspiration was involuntarily connected with power and potential violence. For Griffith to have his own kingdom, he must be a king. The only way for him to achieve that station would be to marry into the royal family and somehow, maybe through violence and coercion become the king's successor. Alternatively, he could be elected by a council if the king is no longer able to rule, though that too would require immense favour with the current nobility. It should be stated as well that these kings and queens have the potential to hold power over every subject in their land as absolute monarchs. This means they can have complete control over legislative, judicial and executive power. In other words, Griffith could write, judge and execute the law at his own whim, bending it to his agenda. That's a lot of power for a young boy. Though, Griffith's aspirations are further validated when he crosses paths with a fortune teller, who gives him a strange red pendant called a bailet. Its name is Peg of the King. He who possesses it shall conquer the world in exchange for his flesh and blood. To a child, these could be mere fascinations. Whether Griffith believed in the prophecy or not, he set forth the plans to achieve his goal, continuously wearing the bailet as a reminder of what he stood to achieve. As Griffith grew through the years, this singular purpose to rule a kingdom motivated his actions, eventuating in him recruiting a group of mercenaries we now know as the Band of the Hawk. Amongst this crew were various skilled fighters, ragtags and cutthroats. However, what they all seemed to have in common was that each of them saw something in Griffith. Maybe not straight away, but eventually there was this feeling. It seemed to elevate them simply by being in his presence and following his lead. We gain more clarity into this phenomenon when Casca, a unit commander of the Hawks, relays her point of view when she first entered the band. I felt as though I was in a dream. An outcast band of commoners became an invincible army. It's miraculous the way we fought. To help ground Griffith's forming legacy was the fact that he was a commoner. This very trait allowed his comrades to feel like they were closer to him and not detached due to his class. Social rank is something Griffith is quite verbal about when he speaks on his dreams. He can be quoted saying, Most men's lives are controlled by a handful of nobles for the convenience of royalty. Well, even a king should be unable to live his life as he pleases. Insinuating that the person with the most power, like a king, should still be kept in check. 
Furthermore, nobility should not be reserved for those of noble blood. He also judges those in positions of power for assuming they have a right to something. Do you think somehow you've been chosen by God just because you're a nobleman? Griffith can be seen as a noble spirit through many of these quotes. However, as he continues, contradictions begin to occur. Take for instance the continuation of this scene. In this world, there must be one man whose preordained course of life is the key to ruling the world, regardless of his existing social position or class. I believe that Griffith is speaking of himself and in turn is creating a narrative to which he becomes the most powerful man. That man could be part of this world's true privileged class. That man could have the absolute power of a god. And here, the alarm bells truly start to sound, as he shuns social class, however, idolizes a neo-social class, one which includes him. And lastly, the mention of a man to god complex is frightening to say the least. Seeing Griffith's ego fill as he spouts prophetic aspirations, one can easily assume him to be convoluted. Guts, a new recruit to the band, certainly thinks so when they first meet. Of course not! I refuse! <coughs> However, we mustn't forget that there is a reason why Griffith is so well received and why the Hawks look up to him. For one, he's a fantastic leader, with a superior ability to rally his troops, inspiring them towards a common goal. His followers are vocal too, as various band members through the series vouch for his leadership. In a scene, just after Guts has been recruited, he asks Judah, another band member, What kind of guy is Griffith, really? I can't really describe it, but I think Griffith really believes in something beyond battle, beyond victory. Something drives him, and it's something ordinary people like us can never understand. Griffith obviously has immense amounts of charisma, but what seems to draw more people in is the impression that he knows more than the common folk. To them, he is special. On top of this, Griffith has a mastery over physical combat, which Caucus, another band member, comments on at the start of the series. Wondering which one of you is stronger? Don't be ridiculous, he's no match for our leader. Isn't that right, Griffith? This message is echoed as Griffith seemingly takes down Guts with ease after his troops are all overcome by the young warrior. Guts even comments on Griffith's masterful tactical skills when he first joins the group on a siege. Launching a surprise attack by traveling up such a rapid stream. Then we set fire from the windward side when we attack from behind. Every element has been pre-calculated in his mind. These skills have allowed the Hawks to overcome hugely difficult battles. Furthermore, his desire to research and learn posits him to always expand his knowledge. And lastly, he knows his way around nobles, common folk, and just about everyone. He has earned his power, and if it's not him to lead, then who should? As Griffith's notoriety continued to climb, more soldiers joined his ranks. Though as they did, the responsibility that came with his leadership began to weigh on his conscience. In a flashback where Casca remembers her earlier days in the band, she tells of how Griffith contemplated over a young boy who was killed in battle. I remember this boy well. When he looked at me, his eyes filled with wonder, as though I were a hero. Was he happy, I wonder? He died while pursuing his dream, but I think it was my dream that killed him. Casca further notes that she had never seen a proud man's shoulders sink so low. From that moment on, Griffith seemed different to me. As time went on, Griffith began to find different ways to achieve his dreams. One option, which granted him resources for his growing army, was to sleep with a wealthy nobleman, one who had a proclivity to younger boys. After the exchange, Griffith attempts to center himself while bathing. The scene is so raw and depicts Griffith at one of his most vulnerable phases as he struggles with a moral crossroad. On one side is Griffith's responsibility for his troops, and on the other is his choice to neglect their well-being. The more battles we fight, the more people we lose. To start, he provides the reality of the situation, along with a reason for sleeping with a nobleman. Casca, however, notes that Griffith still feels guilty for the young boy dying. Which is the lesser risk for me? Losing hundreds of my men in tens of battles? Or receiving what I need from some rich old man? Griffith now doubles down and assures her that this was a logical choice. Since he is a calculated character, it feels believable for him to say this. Though as he continues to talk, we see obvious signs of his psyche battling against itself. Listen, Casca. I feel no responsibility to those comrades who've lost their lives in my service. 
because they chose to fight those battles. Just as you chose. Just as I. This dialogue may be directed towards Casca, however Griffith is really just speaking to his conscience, trying to provide reasons for why he isn't responsible for the lives of those around him. Stating that his troops all chose to follow him means that they are accountable for their own fate. This takes responsibility away from Griffith, which allows him to continue using them to achieve his dream and eliminates any guilt which might stop him. Though as we watch Griffith at this crossroad, we see he is unable to completely choose a path. In reaction to these conflicting options, he begins to cope by driving his nails into his arms. He shakes and constricts, attempting to control the guilt he feels for those who have died under his name, and those who will inevitably die in the future for his cause. If there is one thing I can do for them, for the dead, it is to win and keep Winning until I attain my dream, a dream they clung to and risked their lives for. By stating that his troops have already risked their lives for his kingdom, Griffith can morally justify that the honourable choice is to continue so they haven't died in vain. Although this is his best argument for neglect, and one he uses in future, we see that he still isn't fully convinced as he continues to become more unhinged. My dream is already smeared with blood. I don't regret, I don't feel guilty, but I'd rather sacrifice myself than watch any more innocent children die in the name of my dream." These final lines are riddled with conflicting statements. Griffith admits that he has blood on his hands, though states that he can't feel guilty for it. Then he tries to save his pride by saying he will sacrifice himself so his troops won't die. Although it is complicated in essence, this scene, simply put, is Griffith's ultimate trial. Whether he can separate all his conflicting emotions and instead live by the rule that his dream will always take priority above anyone or anything else. The choice to disconnect from others can be further explored when Griffith responds to Princess Charlotte. After her comment that the leader's friends must be fascinated by him, he responds with this. They are my able soldiers, it's true. They are dedicated comrades who sacrificed themselves for my dream so that it might be real. But that does not make them friends. Unable to call his fellow band members friends, we see the isolation Griffith has placed on himself. This is followed by the criteria he demands in order for him to allow others in. In my mind, a true friend never relies on another's dream. The man who would be my friend must have his own reason for living, beyond me, and he should put his heart and soul into protecting his dream. He should never hesitate to defend it even against me. I believe Griffith has decided that this is what he wants for two reasons. One, because of his pride. He thinks so highly of himself and would only want to confide in a person who is equal to him. And two, because of his conscience. If a man would fight for their own dreams, that would mean Griffith isn't responsible for their life, eliminating any guilt or accountability he has to them. This lack of close companions could be seen as a fatal flaw of the character. Many of us would agree that the whole reason for achieving anything of greatness would be of little use if we couldn't celebrate those wins with the people we care about the most. However, with an army whose accolades were known across the land, to wooing Princess Charlotte and attaining favour with the king, Griffith had now been given the title of Viscount, and in turn had been promoted into nobility, along with the Hawks. The long-awaited dream to have his own kingdom was closer than ever, though there was one possible factor which could break his dedication. The one person he lets in. Guts. The pair's relationship through the series has spanned from enemies to comrades and eventually brothers or perhaps lovers depending on who you ask. Regardless, with each episode, Griffith slowly opens up to Guts. Having been impressed by the warrior's combat ability, ferocity and perhaps even his initial distaste for the cocky leader, Griffith's admiration for the warrior continuously grew. Eventually he would be seen giving Guts special attention. I drew up those plans with your propensities in mind. You are the only person I can trust. What a duel we had that day. The singularly most memorable of my life. 
He also promotes Guts to unit commander above other capable applicants and increasingly speaks to him openly and honestly. Furthermore, he has been shown to look out for Guts in battles and has even put himself in harm's way to ensure Guts' survival. Though, Griffith's attention always comes at a cost. Upon their initial meeting where he defeats Guts, he says this. And so, now you belong to me, Guts. This sense of ownership and power dynamics continued to pop up and was acknowledged by both parties. You should just order me to do your bidding without saying all that other crap. This perhaps is Griffith's way of making sure Guts doesn't step out of line, or maybe Griffith is proving to himself and to Guts that he is worthy and capable of controlling or even protecting the mightiest of warriors. Whatever the motivation, I believe that Griffith saw Guts as the only man who came close to his equal, and perhaps was the only person to make him feel intimidated, emotional, or vulnerable. We can see this in moments like when Griffith reflects on what he has put Guts through. Do you think me a dreadful man? Huh? I had you take such a part in my affairs, while never getting my own hands dirty. I left the most dangerous and difficult tasks to you alone. Do you then not resent me? Guts is one of the only characters Griffith has almost apologized to since the child soldier in his past. This relationship bends those rules Griffith made early on. Rules which allowed him to continue to fight for his dream and not be drowned by the violence of it all. The gravitas of this relationship that Guts and Griffith share shouldn't be understated. As mentioned by Casca in a later scene. Griffith needed someone. A man can't live in isolation with nothing more than a dream. It was you. You made him weak. With this in mind, imagine closing yourself off emotionally and physically to everyone for many, many years in order to achieve your goal. Imagine what it would be like to finally have someone you can trust. Someone you can share your innermost insecurities and aspirations with. It would be monumental. Now, imagine if that person the only person you really wanted to be around, imagine if they wanted nothing to do with you, and left. This leads us to the final battle between the pair, which sets in motion Griffith's downfall. As Guts hopes to leave the Hawks, due to his own reasons, which are explained in my previous video, Griffith orders him to stay. The dialogue in this scene reveals how Griffith reacts when truly emotionally hurt. He begins the interaction with authority. I told you long ago that you belong to me, Guts. I won you that day by my sword. Your life, your death, they are both mine. Hearing these lines, we see the toxicity of Griffith's pride, how he diverts to treating Guts as his property while dealing with the newfound rejection. As the angered leader analyzes Guts, he notes the warrior's reaction. I can sense no anger from him. No rage, no fear. He is empty, present, clear. Is your wish to be free of me so strong? No, I will not allow it. Hurt by the lack of emotion, we now see how jealous and possessive Griffith can be, choosing to turn to violence, even if it means Gut's death. But if I miss my mark by any small degree, I could kill him. No, I cannot allow this. If he will not be mine, his life is forfeit. The pair square up, and Guts skillfully dominates Griffith by breaking his sword and besting him. In that moment, Griffith loses his undefeated title. He becomes a common man who has not only lost his closest friend, but has also lost the power to get him back. With his pride wholeheartedly fractured, Griffith makes the impulsive decision to coerce and sleep with Princess Charlotte, committing high treason in the process. This is all in hope of gaining some form of power to help him move on from the feelings of betrayal and anger he holds towards Guts. However, like a wounded lover, he wakes early in the morning feeling hollow. As we look at the distant gaze of Griffith, his fingers curl and strain as he pours at the mark Guts left. This body language is reminiscent of the bathing scene, both showing self-soothing actions as a means to ground himself. Griffith's choice to seek comfort in another human is relatable. For the average person, this is a common moral dilemma. Who could say they wouldn't want to sleep with another if it could help them forget their worries and previous rejections? Though many of us who have gone down that road may 
may also know that although this might make us feel attractive, desired, and prioritized, after the fact, the feelings which were originally there are still there for us to deal with. And as for Griffith, when making these choices, he is reacting from desperation and weakness, which is a stark contrast to the calculated character we have viewed through the series. His fight with Guts and his choice to sleep with the princess both hinder his ultimate goal, marking the first time Griffith has sabotaged his own progress, prioritizing his pride over his dream. One year has passed since the previous scene. Griffith has been captured and held down in the depths of a dungeon to be continuously tortured. In this portion of the series, we see Griffith deal with the repercussions of his pride as he wrestles with the idea that he will never achieve his dream to lead his own kingdom. At an all-time low, Griffith, in the most violent and dehumanizing way, has been stripped of everything. Once a persuasive genius, combat veteran and scholar, now he fails to speak at all. His body, twisted and tortured, can no longer grip a sword, and as for his mental ability, it is all but consumed by his failures. His bailet, which stood as a metaphor of his chosen destiny, has now been removed, marking a point of decrowning for the promised leader. No longer protected or worshipped, he is simply a husk. I feel nothing, as though there were nothing, and I am floating in it. I have preserved my sanity, have I not? Or did I lose it somewhere? And yet, in this darkness and its fantasies, one thing is still clear. Griffith is of course referring to his mixed feelings towards Guts here. Hatred, friendship, jealousy, indignation, emptiness, love. They all come together in a single great storm, driving a stake through my mind, holding my consciousness together. He marvels at the hold the warrior seems to have over him, and although he blames Guts for his current position, he also states that it is this confusion and intensity that drives him to keep his mind from falling apart labeling Guts as his anchor. Nearing this time, the Hawks stage a rescue mission, and this presents perhaps the most heartbreaking scene between the pair. As Griffith lay immobile on the cold floor, Guts cradles him. In a reaction to those same contradicting feelings that were listed previous, Griffith tries to put his hand around Guts' throat, mumbling his name in a raspy gurgle. This desperate act is an attempt to show some form of power over his comrade. However, as the frail leader strains, Guts instead embraces him, then Griffith chooses to do the same, further expressing the duality of love and hate in their relationship. Guts' tears slowly cascade onto his friend's face, and they sit there in despair. Eventually, Griffith is taken back to the Hawks' new encampment to reprise his role as leader. However, the band, after seeing the condition he is in, realize that won't be possible. Their former leader has completely changed. A notable detail about this transformation is how Griffith's eyes are now depicted. Once a simple glance could strike fear into others, now he can only gaze from a distance. As he watches those around him move on or prosper, the defeated leader broods with jealousy, hatred, and envy. While well, in this state, visions fill his mind. He is visited by his former self, asking, What are you doing here, trembling and afraid? Seeing the two next to each other, it further drives in how far Griffith has deteriorated. He then reflects on his childhood, where his original dream was created. Clinging to his wish, we could criticize Griffith for even contemplating to pick up the mantle again. Though, if we reflect to the sacrifices he has made to even remotely achieve his dream, the isolation, the the prostitution, and his split understanding that those who died for his cause would have done so in vain if he fails, we can see why it's so hard for him to let go. And furthermore, if he doesn't chase that dream, where could he possibly go? Though, I suppose new doors always open in life. This concept is teased when Griffith is lulled by a more pleasant dream, which sees him living in a quiet cabin with Casca. Unable to move, his new wife takes care of him. Well then. My life will be a peaceful one. Though, perhaps the leader, who was envied by many, no longer has this choice at all. 
Waking from his hallucinations, Griffith finds himself in a watery clearing, madly cackling at both his dreams, failures, and condition. In an eruption of these conflicting feelings, he makes a desperate move, bowing his head towards a sharp object in hopes of ending it all and freeing himself from his burdens, dreams, and reality. Though as he pauses a moment and looks down, twined on his fingers is the bailet, a reminder of what he still could achieve. He once more has a choice to make. In exchange for his flesh and blood. Griffith's journey through the anime is captivating to watch. Seeing the dream of a vulnerable child come full circle and eventually crush a man at his summit it paints a vivid picture which warns viewers of the price that power requires, as well as how it can change and corrupt those who wish to wield it. This time, I hope you all find a grand dream to chase, one which requires you to change and grow. Though while you embark on this journey, make sure you learn and accept the terms of your choice. If those terms are hard to digest, try not to take it out on others. Instead, embrace their help. If you are at the peak of your adventure and it all falls apart, know when to let go, or else you may make a choice that will haunt you forever. So, what is the price of your dream? For those of you who are fans of the manga or the anime series and have noted that I still haven't revealed the events of the Eclipse, try not to worry. I realize how monumental these moments are to each of the main characters and side characters, however, I want to cover it in a separate, more fleshed out video. So stay tuned or post a comment so the group and I can hear your opinion. Till next time, and I'll see you soon.